your first acquaintance with the work of Frank McGuinness? Well, Maria. I'll start by saying I was told that I was up for an audition with um, Carthaginian, for Carthaginians for the part of Sarah. I knew Frank, but not very well at the time. So this was serious. So I got the script, read it, and I got as far as Mela's speech, which, if you're aware of it, the opening lines are, she's dead, isn't she? My wee girl is dead. And I couldn't get any further. Three times I tried to read the script. And eventually I had to force myself into ball my way through Mela's speech and then finish the script. So all fine, going in for the audition. Now, actors kind of have this thing. Make a statement, but not too big a statement, okay? Just, you know, just get there. And I knew the husband had a gorgeous sweatshirt that he adored. So I waited till he went out to work, raged at the wardrobe and went in for the audition, wearing this lovely white sweatshirt. Frank is there. Sarah P. Anderson, the director, and I am up to 90, okay? Out comes the fags, because everyone smoked then. <laughs> everyone. And I passed them round, lit my own, lit Frank's, Sarah's, then went to light mine. The top of the match broke, fell down on the husband's uh, uh, sweatshirt, and burnt it all the way down here. Well, I can't begin to tell you what I said, but I can't say it here, okay? Anyway... I got the part, and the sweatshirt is toast. <laughs> Joan? Well, my first uh, encounter with the work of Frank McGuinness was um, Observe the Sons of Ulster, Marching Towards the Psalm, the first production. I had met Frank, um, he had come to, he was going to be working with Team Theatre Company, and he came to see a show that I was doing with the company. And there was a, an instant collision or connection, I would say. <laughs> But I think it's, to echo what Patrick said earlier, it was a time when, you know, new work was so important and new work, there was so much of it, particularly coming, emerging from the peacock, that there was this sense of excitement. I hadn't seen Factory Girls, but there was this sense of excitement about this rough diamond down from Donegal and this work that he was creating in the peacock. And among the theatre community and also amongst audiences to see, what's this going to be about? And hearing that it was going to be about you know, the, the side of Ulster that we didn't talk no, about. Yes. And when I saw Sons of Ulster for the first time, I mean, you, you see, you watch the narrative, you see the characters, you see the plot, then you have the very provocative history and you have the very provocative sexuality of it. Um, but also you have the extraordinary play acting that goes on in it, the extraordinary comedy. And then you have the ritual and almost the religiosity. And I'm watching thinking, how can a play be so many things at once? And how can it move seamlessly? How can it be so layered and seamlessly moving from one layer to another? So that would have been my first encounter with his work. Just handing you the, the microphone again, you, work, you worked in Carthaginians with the Druid production and I suppose especially in a little while we're going to be hearing from the Ad Astra performance. So I wonder if you could give us some of just your recollections of that and we'll come back to Maria, who was of course in the first production. Yes, I was cast in the, uh, in the part of Sarah in the Druid production that Frank himself directed. And by this stage, I knew Frank well as a friend and... I was under the misapprehension that we were going into a democratic rehearsal situation. <laughs> that was very quickly dispelled. Uh, and I remember very clearly, um, you know, we'd, st we'd start rehearsing and um, you'd say to Frank, I was wondering now, would Sarah move here? Howled your ground, was what you'd be told. Would you not think? No. No. <laughs> and again, you'd, you'd, you'd suggest something else or question something, and he'd say, well, I don't agree, and I've just spoken to the writer, and he agrees with me. <laughs> so it was, it was, I suppose what I came out of that the thinking, though, was, like, what Frank was so strong on was the primacy of the text, That's you know, and that the yeah. hold your ground came from that. 
and um, it's been a great lesson. <laughs> I remember one point in the middle of rehearsals, again doing a Joan on it and going, um, Frank, would you not think? And he stopped and he looked at me and he said, have you got a sweet in your mouth? <laughs> and I said, uh, I have. That's what I felt like when I was six in primary school. <laughs> I, I choked myself swallowing it, but it was a fabulous experience, wasn't it? It was the best three months I can remember of life. Um, I was very struck by a comment Patrick made earlier um, about the importance of characters and just thinking myself as a, a member of, a, of the audience, how many of Frank's characters have stayed with me. So I can only imagine from the point of view of, of, of the acting life. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that, of how those characters you know, have stayed in different ways? Well, um, the character Mela that I played in, with, with Frank in the second production, I, she'll never leave me. She, as a piece of writing, it's absolutely perfect. Um, and all the awe I used to feel for Frank before I knew him came back every time I used to approach that piece of writing because it's, it's just impossible to go through that speech. Every time I had to say the speech at night, it came back to me just how wonderful it was. And it's just that she stays with me. That and God knows many others. But that is the one that has certainly stayed with me. Yes, I, I think the character that stays with me a lot is actually a play of Frank's that I directed, Bag Lady, with Cathy Belton playing the, the, the matchbox, sorry, with the matchbox with um, Cathy Belton playing the part of, um, of Sal. And again, like in in the way Frank builds a character, you know, you start off with, you know, an isolated, you know, youngish woman, you know, chatting, just talking about living in a lonely place and talking about um, um, a, a birthday party, you know, a, a birthday party she remembers and an odd friend as a, that she had as a child and then a pet rabbit who was very badly behaved. And bit by bit, this extraordinary story unfolds. And also, this woman grows in front of your eyes into, you know, a very complex and a very dangerous human being. But as a character, also like going again and talking about that layering, going from an ordinary woman, and she is an ordinary woman, an ordinary working class woman, but there's something mythological about her as the play moves on. So I think as the character that springs to mind when I think of his work is that one. I think I had the same thing with um, Bag Lady, that just Frank's one woman play where you dive in, It's and this is a fitting metaphor, you dive in and you really don't take a breath until you surface at the very end of it. it was, it's the most, um, again, an amazing, amazing piece of writing. I, the first time I ever played it, I played it in the Focus Theatre, and I would be as close as two, uh, two inches from Shane there, doing these incredibly tough, heart-searing speeches that are like peeling an onion out of an emotion. And sometimes I used to look into the eyes of the poor person to whom I was literally giving my all here. And, and I really want to stop and say, honestly, I'm only acting. It's fine. <laughs> it, it was wonderful when um, Hiroko, you know, played the clip for us earlier and just to have that sense of, of the theatrical space internationally. And I suppose so often today, the peacock indeed has been invoked. I just want to ask you a little about, about space from your point of view um, as actors. You're just you're, Again, your memories of, of the space and, and I suppose really by extension, fr again, Frank's use of that space. And maybe thinking in particular, Joan, your work is directing what the what, again, if you could tell us a little more about that. Yeah, I think the question you ask is very interesting. And I think listening to Joe earlier, when he talked about the, you know, what oh, the, the impetus you know, to create a space. And again, when you think of many of the spaces in Frank's plays, Sons of Ulster, then you think of the, the, the graveyard in Carthaginians, but the way in which that can be, can be described or can be, you know, made and in, in created in, in such different ways. Um, I, again, then in, I, certainly I know when we, when we looked at, um, at the matchbox, 
you know, because the, char the character is enclosed and yet Paul Keoghan designed it and he, we very much wanted the outside of Valencia Island to be part of it. And because Valencia Island and her retreat there is so important. And, and that came completely from, from the play and the sense of the play. So it was that making of walls, but walls that could become, you were, you were building a house, but walls that could become almost transparent mm -hmm. so that the, the outside was at all times coming in. And I know when we started rehearsals, I just had one idea of a woman standing at a door, because if I'm from the country, you're always standing at the door, <laughs> looking out to see what's going to happen. And, and I think like Frank's plays, there's, there's something in them that his sense of space, just what you're asking about, is very strong. And it, it, it well, like Joe was talking earlier in his conversations with Patrick, I think it comes to you very quickly. What's the right space for this play at this time? I'm particularly, I suppose, thinking as um, as a teacher, and, and and just it's so wonderful to have to have students here who have a sense of, of of Frank's work, but maybe sometimes on the on the page, you know, rather than performance. And that's why you know your stories are, are so powerful um, in that regard. But to move maybe just in the last couple of minutes, because we only have a few minutes to to the realm of of, of the personal. Um, I mean, you both are friends of, of Frank's. I mean, that's not always the relationship between actors. <laughs> Playwright. So off you go. <laughs> I'm going to regret this wholeheartedly, okay? But I utterly adore Frank McGuinness. He has been the most amazing friend. He has he's participated actively and passively in the rearing of my two daughters. I won't go into it, okay? <laughs> he has just been generous, kind, warm. All of the things that everybody says about him multiplied by 20. I'm so grateful to have him in my life. Yeah, I absolutely agree with Maria and everything everybody has said about his generosity. Um, and he is, he's a friend in the best sense of the word because he is a provocative friend as well. Uh, you know, and, and just when you think, you know, <laughs> when, you're, when you're moving towards any kind of self-importance, um, Frank is very quick. But Frank you know, like his plays, he understands life on so many different levels, you know, and he he, he knows how to celebrate, he knows how to have fun, but he also, he understands sadness and grief so well. And again, as was talked about earlier, he knows he can't fix it, he can't fix his characters, and he can't fix it for any of our experiences, but his humanity, is vast. Uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful friend. I think they're closing words. <laughs> Thank you. Both.